it's portable, that's good. Um, so um, our next speaker is uh, Helen Derbyshire, um, Executive Director of uh, Access Info, which, um, correct me if I misrepresent Helen, I'm sure you will, <laughs> uh, is basically a civil society organization which uh, um, uh, focuses on uh, initiatives that, in that uh, uh, stimulate transparency within government. So it's way beyond um, the reuse open data uh, uh, discussion, but more about accountability also, uh, democratic accountability within government. And she'll give us um, their perspective um, on the uh, revised PSI directive. Thank you very much, Morel. Um, good morning, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, and many dear friends who are here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the organisers for the invitation. Thanks to Kathleen, who's unfortunately no longer part of the PSI network. She's moved on to probably greater things. But, um, and to Natasha Piet Musar, um, the Slovenian Information Commissioner, uh, who unfortunately is not with us, although Christina stepped into her shoes. Um, big shoes. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to come to beautiful Ljubljana, um, and particularly, as the Minister mentioned, a country which is really um, at the forefront of promoting the right of access to information with a very strong access to information law. I can confirm that um, claim. Um, uh, and it's great that you're strengthening it. That's, that's, that's very positive. You'll get to the really very top of the rating. Um, so I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about the reuse directive, uh, but from a particular perspective which I bring, which is the right of access to information. And I'm going to question what are the fundamental principles we're talking about here. And I fear that I may not be incredibly helpful or constructive. Um, I warn you that, and I apologize at the outset if that's the case. Um, because I'm bringing a different perspective to this community. And it's something that I've been doing for the last few years. Um, but I think it's a very important perspective. Last night, quite a few people were congratulating me on the recent win by Access Info Europe in a, before the European Court of Justice in a case we had against the Council of the European Union to get more information out of the Council. Um, that's the kind of thing that we do. That's the Access Info's bread and butter work. Um, and people were telling me how helpful that was to get that ruling. As I say, I, I'll try to be constructively critical at least. Um, and I'm going to use a little analogy to try to explain what I want to do in the next 10 minutes, which is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the history of astronomy, um, but for many years after uh, Ptolemy, we tried to explain the movement of the planets based on a geocentric system. And it was very complex because if you have the Earth at the center of the universe, the planets zigzag all over the place. And the result of the kind of models, I can't move from the microphone, the result of the models which we evolved looks something like this tree, actually, lovely tree. I can't actually see that it's got the right of access to information on it, something I'll correct later. Um, it's a lovely tree, but it's a little bit complex. If you compare it, grabbing my props here, with a, a single rose, for example. This is the heliocentric system of the universe, a very simple explanation. The sun is at the center, and the planets move around the sun. So, my model of the right of access to information, my sun, using this analogy, um, thanks to people like Copernicus, um, is the right of access to information. That this is the basis on which we should build our model of putting information created and held by government bodies into the public domain. Um, what do we know about this right very briefly? Um, many of you are familiar with this, but I'll just run through it fast to make sure everyone's up to speed. The right of access to information has been recognized by international human rights tribunals as a fundamental right linked to freedom of expression. International uh, court, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee, all have said that in order to be able to exercise our right to freedom of opinion and expression, we have a right of access to information held by public bodies. A definition of public bodies which includes private bodies performing public functions and operating with public funds. And 
in addition, so we have the judges of these international tribunals had to find a hook in the existing human rights framework to hang it on. They couldn't create a new standalone right. Maybe it would have been better if they could have done that, but they couldn't, and they linked freedom of expression and the right of access to information. In addition to that, we have many constitutions, like the Slovenian constitution, and indeed like the treaties of the European Union after Lisbon, which recognize a fundamental right of access to information or documents at the national level in many countries, and for the EU, a fundamental right for, of all of us, for all of us to access documents held by the European Union. If that's our starting point, if freedom of expression is linked inherently, or if, if access to information is linked inherently to freedom of expression, that raises a question as to why we need um, a legal framework for permission, if you like, to reuse information. I'll come back to that question in a second. But just to, to say that the first sort of movement that we have to take into consideration is the freedom of information movement and all it's achieved. Then we have, in parallel with that, over the last decade, or perhaps slightly less, um, we've had the open data movement, which we've heard reference to this morning. And the open data movement came along and argued the social and economic value of opening up government data sets en masse. In a way, the open data movement provided a kind of pull to the push that was already happening from a, a human rights perspective. The UN Human Rights Committee made very clear that the right of access to information is not only an obligation, places an obligation on governments, not only to answer requests for information, but also to push information out into the public domain proactively. So there's an obligation based on human rights law for governments to publish information proactively, but clearly having all the initiatives around open data is helping tremendously to make that a reality. There's been some talk about whether we need a right to data. I don't actually think we need a right to data because we've already got a right of access to information. And then in parallel with that again, over the last decade or since 2000, uh, Dr. Ullman, you mentioned, Ullman, um, uh, since 2000, you've been working on trying to break these monopolistic use, uh, the, 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 the exclusive licenses which were being granted for access to certain key data sets. There was clearly a need to do something about that situation. And the PSI directive has been the way of solving that problem. Um, so I understand completely why the PSI directive exists and where it comes from. And the value in encouraging governments, again, to open up their data sets more widely. And I had some conversations with people here last night and this morning, particularly on the user side, about what, why and how the PSI Directive has been, has been very useful. However, and this is quite a significant however, what I see from an access to information perspective is that it's creating a series of problems for the right of access to information. In fact, I would say it's driving a wedge between our right as citizens to access information and our right to do something with it. Um, the, 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 and this, this seems to me to run completely counter to the concept that if, I ha if, if access to information is part of freedom of expression, then I have the right not only to access the information, but to use it to form my opinion, to express my opinion, and to disseminate that information. The right to uh, disseminate and to receive information. Um, that, in, in theory, and in an ideal world, we wouldn't need a PSI directive because we'd all have the right to access all government information and we would be able to do what we want with it. And we wouldn't even have to pay for it because essentially, I mean, I'm to, I think Christina's laughing, but <laughs> it, I'm talking about a very ideal world. But, and that's not the world we live in, which is why we have the PSI directive. The problem then, uh, and what, what I'll do is just point to a couple of the specific problems which are being created and perhaps try to open up the debate for the course of today 
as to how we can anticipate and address those problems so that the new PSI directive serves the goals which um, the people who've been pushing it and getting it adopted have, which is to create this level playing field for the use of these high-value data sets, and yet at the same time not interfere with the right of access to information. What do I mean when I say it's interfering with our right of access to information? What's happening is that requesters who are requesting small chunks of data are being asked to demonstrate um, why they want to use that data, who they are, whether the use is going to be commercial or non-commercial. Um, and we have examples from different countries. I was um, talking last night about an example from Poland where people were requesting small bits of budget data from local government authorities and were being required to fill in reuse forms um, explaining why they wanted to use the data, how they were going to use it, and whether there was going to be any commercial use involved. That's a significant problem. We also have problems such as how do we define precisely commercial use? If I'm a journalist and I'm going to publish some of this data in my online news portal, um, which is a commercial operation with advertising, is that commercial reuse? Should I then have to pay for a small amount of data about how a local government budget is being spent because the public body has the idea that it can charge when there's going to be re commercial reuse of this data. Um, I understand that this question about whether it was already being charged for or not, um, but many people don't have that clear. And, and this is obviously where the, 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 the European Commission needs to be very vigilant in terms of how the language, which has been fairly carefully thought about and argued over, is actually being interpreted. The problem we've got with the new directive, with its very broad definition of information, is that I fear that it's so broad that it's going to apply to all information which uh, currently is accessible under freedom of information, access to information laws. It sounds good, but in practice, it's, as, as more and more public officials become aware of the need to apply their national reuse laws, those, those are being taken into account as well as the right of access to information. Then there's the question of purpose. The directive defines purpose as any use other than that for which the information was created. Well, frankly, that's almost any use that any member of the public wants to make of any information. I, as a citizen, as a human rights activist, I don't request information from government for the same purpose as it was created for. If I, if I request access to uh, a public procurement contract because I'm an anti-corruption activist, that's not the purpose the government created the information for. And there are multiple examples like that. So there's a danger there in when, when someone's requesting it, they're being asked, and this is happening, people are being asked, why do you want to use this? There is language in the directive about the proper use of documents. I still see that as very dangerous in many countries where public officials are very afraid of how information is being, going to be used. They're concerned to give it out because it will be used to criticize, for example. Is that the proper use of documents? Is that the purpose for which information was created? Um, another, another phrase in the directive which I find worrisome is that there's no obligation to permit reuse. That, again, runs directly counter to the idea that if I have a right of access, I should have a right to use that information, exercising my right to freedom of expression. The directive talks about a right to knowledge. In the international human rights framework, we don't have a right to knowledge. We have a right to form an opinion, which I guess is as close as we can get to a right to knowledge, but primarily we have a right to freedom of expression. It's, it's great to be able to access a document so that I know, but it's very rare that I just want to know. I want to share my knowledge one way or another. Um, and then there's the question of costs. Um, maybe they go down, but for some, in some cases the costs are going up, or at least the PSI directive is not serving to break the cost barrier that's resulting in unequal access to information. And I'll finish by giving one example of this, which is company registers. Company registers around Europe, and I know because out of access info, we've just filed requests for information in about 30 countries, working with a network of investigative journalists 
who want access to company registers because they're tracking um, uh, mafiosi and organized crime figures. Journalists coming from this, well, I know I'm not allowed to say that Slovenia is part of the Balkans, but um, <laughs> seeming that the Balkans the Vulcan starts in Vienna, as someone once famously said, this part of the world. Um, uh, so there's a group of uh, journalists based out of Sarajevo called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which is trying to track criminals, and they need access to companies' registers because companies created in other parts of Europe are used to launder money and to hide, um, to hide the activities of some of these, uh, some illegal activities. So we've tried requesting the uh, company registers under the right of access to information. And so far, we have not been successful in any single country. We're trying here in Slovenia as well. I'm meeting the journalist in the coffee break who's going to be doing the request. And I can tell the information commissioner that a request is coming your way. Well, Natasha's not here, but uh, a, a, an appeal will be coming your way very soon. Um, because rather than treating our request as an access to information request, it's been treated as a reuse request we have to prove. We've been asked to provide our statutes to prove that we're going to use this for non-commercial purposes. Um, so even though in Slovenia we wouldn't have to pay for this data, we still had to jump through a number of hoops to get it when there's a clear public interest in these journalists having access to this information. The, the, the G8 uh, declaration which has been mentioned is fantastic. It says that company registers are a high value data set for democracy which should be made available. These declarations are wonderful, but they have not yet been translated into practice. And we are still having to pay for much of these high value data sets. Um, my organization, the, the requests that we've been filing, we've been quoted anything between 10,000 euros for access to an entire data set to I think the highest specific quote we've had so far in the Netherlands, if we as an NGO would like access to the Dutch com companies register, we would have to pay 75,000 euros. It's two and a half million records at uh, three cents a record, which sounds pretty cheap, but when you add it up, it's a lot of money. How is the new PSI directive going to help civil society, investigative journalists, human rights activists get access to some of this kind of information whose value to society has been recognized? That's something that's not clear. I think it's not an insurmountable problem. I know that there are public bodies whose economic model is based on selling of this data. Clearly, there needs to be a transition phase if we're going to transit away from these very high charges. But I have to say that right now, from a right of access to information perspective, um, the PSI directive is not only perhaps not helping open up government data, it's even in some cases hindering access to it. And that's something that we need to discuss the solutions to and work on. Um, so there are some, some thoughts to throw into the mix for today's conversation. Um, and very much looking forward to having that conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Helen, for um, making insightful to everybody the tension there is between the sort of more socio-economic approach to opening up government information and the sort of, I would say, classic democratic accountability approach, um, um, which I know in the Netherlands has been a topic of debate for, um, for quite a while. 